Aishan, thanks for joining me today. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, so the sort of occasion for this is that uh, you held this wonderful solar punk contest that just finished up, and I have the privilege of submitting something myself that was a, a lot of fun for me, and a few of my friends did as well, and uh, was really just inspired by the whole contest and the premise of it, and want to hear about that. But um, yeah, I'd love to just start with maybe having you introduce yourself and share who you are and, and maybe your background and to whatever extent you'd like to share your, your life story as well, just kind of how you got here today. Oh, that's a long life story. Mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and whatever detail you'd like to share. Yeah, I guess um, I grew up in Minnesota and uh, I worked in the tech industry for uh, most of my career after, you know, after graduating from school. Um, I worked at, uh, I started out actually in, Right after the crash of the first dot com boom, which most people don't remember now, since we've had a lot of like economic ups and downs since then, but th there was a crash back in 2000 and 2001. Um, and I, I started my career actually in the sort of in the nuclear winter of tech, um, working at PayPal, which was one of the two tech companies, one of the only two tech companies that was still hiring at the time and that was still. You know, I actually like successfully building a business. It was like PayPal, and then there was Google. Um, so right out of school, I was working for like one of those two companies, uh, and then that went pretty well. And then I joined uh, Facebook in two thousand five. Um, did a bunch of stuff there, and then after I left Facebook, um, there were a couple years, you know, where I was just like working on some independent projects and doing some consulting. Um, and then I took a job as the CEO of Reddit, which was very, that was, that was very turbulent, um, <laughs> as Reddit tends to be. Uh, and then after I left that, I spent some time just sort of like detoxing from like the, you know, very, I don't know, like aggressive life of being in tech and spent some time in Hawaii. Uh, and then... You know, in like 2017, you know, it was like sitting on the beach actually, right? And it was really hot. And, you know, it's supposed to be hot in Hawaii, but it was like way, way too hot. It was like crazy, right? Um, and, you know, I, I was talking to some some locals who've lived here for a long time and they're like, you know, it's like never been this hot. This is like a really weird historical anomaly. Um, you know, like I live up in the mountains and it's usually cool up there and, but it was like 88 last night i couldn't sleep and you know you don't have ac there because like normally the, the, the climate is cool um and so i was like okay this climate change thing has got to stop um and so, so i was sort of like everyone who works in climate i've found has like a sort of key moment right where they realize okay this is a problem and i need to work on it right like i need to now solve um i've never met anyone who like got into climate and then like decided it was done, right? They, you have this moment, you work on climate, and then that's your life, right? There's all these people in the world who are just like, they're living their lives and then they realize again, this is now the thing that they have to do. And then, so it's so drawing more and more people into it as their life's mission, um, because the problem is just like not really, you know, it's not solved. Uh, and so that was when I started doing research into um, potential, uh, like actual direct solutions to climate um, as well. and and, and also like geoengineering um, solutions, which is really interesting because I think like a lot of times um, reforestation is not viewed as a geoengineering solution. It's viewed as like a natural carbon capture solution, like as opposed to geoengineering solutions, uh, which are typically like described as being, or sort of thought of as being like more directly engineered. Um, but in fact, the, the, the angle I had approached this from was, you know, looking at all large scale geoengineering solutions um and when you look at them from a like i don't know it's like a, a practical viewpoint right if, you, if you're like okay i'm looking for solutions and i'm gonna actually have to do it right as opposed to like you know just like hanging out with your friends like thinking of crazy solutions right um then like uh it, it actually like makes it very different because suddenly you're like thinking of 
like, okay, what are the actual criteria for an actual practical implementation of a solution? Like if you actually have to do it, right? And you realize there's a whole bunch of criteria. Um, and it's not just like, a lot of people just look at like cost, right? And it's like, it's not just like upfront cost, it's also like ongoing cost. Um, there's also the, the question of like whether it moves the, the system to a new stable equilibrium or it's an unstable equilibrium where you have to keep putting in energy. Um, you also have to look at uh, overshoot potential and tunability. Like if, uh, sort of like you know, any, any really large plan, you sort of have to calculate how much of it you have to do and you sort of turn the dial a certain way. But you don't actually know if that's the correct point. Um, and so you don't want to overshoot on any sort of climate change corrective measure because then you freeze the planet. Um, and so, so you have to be able to, so the solution has to lend itself to very good monitoring and the ability to tune it back, like tune it back and forth actually, um, to get, you know, the, you know, the atmospheric composition and temperature to the right point, right? So you need something that's very tunable. Um, you don't want something that's just like a straight shot to where you think it's going to be because like, you know, collectively, we don't actually know exactly how we have to do it. Um, and then there's like, what is the level of technology needed to implement it? Uh, because if you have a, if you have a solution that requires a very high degree of technology, that limits the number of countries who can participate. Um, it makes it so that you can only implement that in a relatively small number of countries with a really high technological base. And because it's really large, um, it's going to take some like non-trivial amount of economic resources, no matter what. And so if you have like, for example, like a macroeconomic dislocation um, and that economy like stumbles, then, uh, you know, then you, then you have like a big break in your implementation of the solution, right? Whereas if you have like a solution that everyone can participate in, right, it requires a relatively low level of technology, um, then it's much more inclusive. Uh, you can have a hundred countries all contributing to it uh, and, you know, if like one of them stumbles or something or something interrupts it, you know, there's many more that can sort of pick up the slack. Um, so that's actually really important for like a sort of global scale effort. Uh, and then there's also like political feasibility, right? And like in 2017, we weren't really sure, right? Like, what if you can't convince everybody to do it, right? Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, can it be held up by a recalcitrant, single recalcitrant actor? Um, so, so you want something that like requires only like a majority of people to want to be to do it and it can't be held up if like you don't get unanimous know, consensus um and then uh i think there's like uh, i can't remember there, there, there's like a few other like criteria it turns out so there's like something like 12 different criteria that you would you would need to evaluate solutions on um and so after looking at like all of the you know geoengineering proposals that had ever been thought up um it was actually really clear that like massive reforestation was like by far the most feasible one and like by like an order of magnitude, right? <laughs> like many metrics. Uh, and so, so it was like, okay, well, uh, so, so I started doing more research into like exactly how you would do it. Like, you know, exactly how much would it cost? Would it be feasible? Um, the previous scientific consensus was that there's not enough land to you know, plant enough forests to offset all of the emissions that you would need to. But it turns out that you can uh, you can create more land by regreening deserts. Um, and there have been projects that have successfully done this over the past few decades. But the main limiting factor was always freshwater availability, which uh, was a problem, except that you know, so, so you can't like just use existing freshwater supplies, right? Because like if you, if you plant tons of forests, it's actually going to like threaten the groundwater availability. Um, and we already have a freshwater scarcity problem. So um, the only other source of freshwater is through um, desalination. But that requires a lot of energy. And so until recently, it was only economically uh, viable if you used like cheap fossil fuels, which is why it was, you know, like most of desalination occurs in the Middle East where they have access to cheap fossil fuels, right? And they need water. Um, but you can't do that if you're trying to solve climate because then you're just like emitting a ton of, right? Like carbon while, while you're trying to produce water to, you know, plant trees. Um, I, I think actually the, the, the numbers make it so that that would be just like outright going backwards. 
Um, however, in 2018, the cost of solar dropped below that of fossil fuels. Um, this was something that actually is still not very well known because when that cost curve was, when that, when that cost curve, you know, like hit that threshold, um, it happened in 2018, but when that happens in a market, the analyst that writes about it, writes about it in 2019. So in 2019, you look at all the prices from the previous year, you write your analyst report, right? And so that came out in 2019. And pretty soon after COVID hit, and so the entire world was occupied by COVID. So nobody really cared about that analyst. Like the analyst report came out in like a few, um, like sort of climate energy blogs. Um, and so we're still in COVID, so people don't really, still don't really know about this. But this is actually really, really important for solar, solar and wind, actually, um, to have dropped below the cost of the marginal cost of fossil fuels. So it's actually a, economically favorable to build a new solar generating plant than to continue running old coal plants. Um, so that inversion is actually really, really, really important, uh, not just because of the implication for transition to solar overall, but because you can now use solar to run desalination. Um, and there's this nice thing where, uh, so I mean, are, you, are you familiar with the solar intermittency issue? It's, nope. it's actually, well, I'll just explain it, right? Um, so solar intermittency is, is really just, the sun sometimes goes behind clouds and you don't generate power at night, right? Like okay. You only get solar power when, it's, when the sun's shining. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's actually, that's a problem because people want po power at night. So you, you, know, you can, you, you generate solar and um, you have to put it, you have to store it in batteries. Batteries are still relatively, really expensive. Um, they're, they're also dropping in cost really quickly. It's, it's actually a similarly shaped curve, but they're still pretty expensive. And what that means is that right now, the economic case for transitioning to solar for like 100% solar for residential and commercial is still a little bit difficult. It's actually why the world isn't just like going right to solar right now, just because economically it's still not a slam dunk. Um, however, um, for applications that are not subject to solar intermittency, that is, if you can only if you can just do it when the sun is shining and you don't care about doing it at night, you don't need batteries, you can go directly to solar, and the solar panels are really cheap, um, and so. Desalination is actually one of those applications. You can just desalinate water during the day. You store the fresh water in tanks, right? Which are, so you, essentially you change your battery storage from batteries to tanks, which are like a hundred times cheaper. Mm -hmm. right? And so what this means is that the world can actually leapfrog the solar residential commercial transition for, you know, to, for desalination by like four or five years. Right, it's, it's anticipated in like four or five years, batteries will get to the point where we can make that transition. Um, but we can make that transition for desalination and things like water pumping, which is also a thing that you only need to do during the day or that you can do only during the day, um, right now. And so what that means is we can now deploy solar power desalination at arbitrarily large scales, like right, starting right now. Um, using present technology and the cost will continue to go down. Um, so that has that is at least two large consequences. One is that the freshwater scarcity problem is now solved. Um, in like 10 or 15 years, once people sort of fully internalize this and build out all these industries, um, every almost every water starved region can now gen can now just like affordably generate uh, fresh water. Um, using solar power desalination, right? So, so like all these areas. Um, that's actually really huge. Um, a, like the basis of wealth is actually access to fresh water. Um, people don't really realize this anymore because it's so basic. But if you look at where all of the um, successful civilizations arose, it's always in areas which are considered agriculturally fertile. And what that really means is it has access to water on a macro basis. So now that that's going to be solved. Like this is actually gonna change like the course of human history. Um, so um, on the other, uh, and the other thing is we can now also generate enough fresh water to irrigate um, what we roughly calculated to be like 3 billion acres 
of net new forest, which is roughly the amount that you need. It's, it's about a trillion trees. Right? It's about 300 trees per acre um, to offset all or most of human uh, carbon emissions. So we, we now have a solution that's within reach. Um, and you know, worst case will get us into the correct order of magnitude um, to solve climate change or at least offset all or most of human emissions. It actually has to be done in conjunction with the drive to carbon net zero. Um, but so here to like kind of bad news, which <laughs> is that like uh, the it's an IPCC AR6 report says that even if the world hits all of its net zero commitments by 2050, which is very ambitious, right? Like, <laughs> like nobody really thinks we'll hit those commitments, but like in the most optimistic scenario, we hit all of our net zero commitments and get net zero by 2050. Um, we still we have already locked in two degrees of warming through the end of the century, um, and and when I say end of the century, I just mean you know the the sort of graph only goes out to the end of the century, right? It doesn't it doesn't end at the it's, you know that's that's like maybe there's another century left of two degrees of warming, right? And and all of the crazy weather effect that we, weather effects that we've had so far, right? That you've seen is like that's one point one degree of warming, mm -hmm. so. Um, we're locked in for two degrees, even if we totally decarbonize our economy, mm. right? So what actually has to happen at the same time as going to net zero is we need to construct an enormous carbon sink to pull down all of, all of the extra CO2 that's currently hanging around in the atmosphere. Like we have to stop putting more in and we have to pull all that stuff out. Um, and a you know, massive global forest restoration program uh, is of the correct scale to do that. So if we do both of those things, we can in fact draw down all or most of the CO2 that's still hanging around in the atmosphere. Um, and that can probably happen, you know, if we hit net zero and we complete this carbon sink, um, we can probably draw it down in maybe like a decade and a half um, after hitting net zero. So that would mean that we can solve climate change, right, by the middle, of, by a little bit after the middle of the century. So, um, I did like all of this math and read like all of these like research papers on like the the you know what we knew to the best of our you know research about like trees and forests, and carbon sequestration, um, and like energy and all this stuff. Um, and you know, I came to this conclusion. I was like, oh, okay, so there is a solution to climate change. Um, you know, it's like feasible. It does not require the development of any radical new technology, um, and and that's a that's a bigger hurdle than most people think, right? Like Silicon Valley marketing has done a very good job of making people think, yeah, we can just produce whatever magical technology we need, it, right? And like I, I like that marketing because like I work in that industry, right? It helps make me look really cool, right? But it's it's actually it's it's really hard. It's it's as hard as you know you might think it is. Um, but just we, we can build this giant um, thing in parallel. Um, it doesn't require high levels of technology. And it's definitely something we can do if we have the willpower to do so. And so what that means is we can solve climate change, you know, a little bit after the middle of the century. Uh, and so, you know, I did those calculations. And like my wife says, like, like one day I came down from my, came out of my office after having done like a bunch of math for like, months and, and said like i think we can solve climate change by planting trees <laughs> and she was like okay great All right you know go take out the dishes <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um and, and and so it's like all right so i really didn't want to get back to being a ceo again because it was like so hard um when i was running reddit but after a while and you know i would i would like discuss this plan on various like climate change forums. Um, and, you know, no one could really seem to poke a hole into it, right? It, 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 it was, you know, it's a really, any big plan has lots of flaws, right? It's just like very big, you can always find something wrong with it. Um, but it seemed like it was like the least implausible plan <laughs> for climate change. So I was like, okay, fine. Well, we have to create a company and we have to make this happen. Right, so so that's what we did, um, and uh, so 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 that's the company I'm running now, um, and we started it uh, on January first of 2020, um, which seems like a coincidence, but it's really big. 
Delaware filing was whatever. Um, and then the pandemic hit, which seemed like it was gonna be really, really bad for us, but it turned out to be totally okay. Cause if you start a company and the pandemic hits, you're just like, okay, we're just like remote first, right? I mean, it's a global operation anyway. So it turned out to be pretty good because all of the work in the company was either work that you could do if you were sitting at a computer by yourself or if you were outside and you were planting trees, you could very easily just like socially distance, right? Like you, if you're planting trees, you don't have to be more than like 15 feet from another person, right? So, so we were able to just like continue um, all through 2020. Um, and earlier this year, we raised like our $30 million Series A. Um, so yeah, we're just like off and running. Hmm. So what is the basic um, like sort of value proposition of the company to allow reforestation and what's the sort of economic model behind it? Um, the, the core economic model is like land improvement. Um, we're, if you take land that's like barren and there's nothing on it, in, in particular, our, our, the, one of our differentiators is that um, because we can bring water to a project, we can restore dry or degraded land that's relatively like, like low value. Like, you know, the, the, the way I had originally calculated the plan was, okay, what if we have to use really worthless land, like the land that the least desirable land, because let's assume that everyone who owns really nice land isn't gonna let us plant trees on it. Um, this was in 2017, so it was, it was like pretty, uh, you know, pessimistic, right? Like now, now the tide is really turning. Um, so, um, so it's like, okay, can we do it on like the least valuable land, which was desert, which is how we got to the, you know, regreening deserts. Thing. So if you can take extremely low value, undesirable land that nobody wants, and you can restore it to a thriving forest, that's a clear increase in the value of the land. It, it also increases the value of the land around it. Um, because uh, another thing that many people do not realize is they think uh, rain brings forests. And that's not really true. You do need water to restore forests, but ultimately forests are what bring rain. Um, <clears throat> the fact that trees hold a lot of water means that they cool the air and that causes the precipitation. And that's what, what, that, that, that's what changes the microclimate and brings rain. Um, and so forests become self-perpetuating and they also improve the fertility of the land around it. So, on a macro level, it's like a giant global real estate play, right? We're taking low value land and we're turning it into thriving forest um, that increases the value of that land and the land around it. Uh, I can go into like more detail, but you know, that's sort of a high level thing. And it's like different for every project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What did you have to sort of put in place to establish the company? Like what did that process involve for creating terraformation? Um, there's no, okay, so, so there's like the legal mm -hmm. structure that you have to put in place. Um, and then there's like recruiting people to the mission. Um, the, th there's actually now like a series, there's a whole set of, I don't know what you call like SaaS applications, just like cloud applications that allow you to put together the legal structure of your company, set up like an HR process. Um, and, and do all of what was even 10 years ago, like pretty hard to do. Um, so I was able to just like do that, like using a bunch of apps, right? So it does the, does the filing for you, like in Delaware. Um, it sets up the sort of initial corporate resolutions. Um, it sets up like a stock plan. You have templates for offer letters. Um, and then there's other, uh, other services that allow you to just like administer all of your basic, um, I don't know, like employee agreements, right? Um, do payroll. Um, so that that was actually way more straightforward or, or way easier than I, like the last time, the last time I ran a company, right? Which was Reddit. And and you had to do things like, you, you actually like go, like you have to enter into this like, weird partnership with like companies like Trinet to like do all your businesses where essentially like your employees become employees of both your company and that company. Oh. And that company is a large company that like gives, does all the benefits. Like that's actually the legal structure of the results. Um, and, and they're like, just like a big company, even though they work with startups and it's like actually a lot of trouble. 
now it's all just like, okay, this is like a cloud application, right? And it's like, okay, here's our, all your benefits. Here's all the payroll. It's like, it's doing all this stuff for you. Um, so the process of creating a company now is much more lightweight. It's much more appified. I was able to get really, really far um, setting up the corporate infrastructure. And, and most importantly, like not having to make a big risky outlay, right? To like set up payroll processing with like this huge company. Um, and so I was able to get things to be like pretty, um, pretty before this, if you were a small business and you couldn't, and you weren't going to be immediately really, really large, you set up all this stuff manually. And so you were just like writing checks. And so if you're a small business, it's like really hard to get all your accounting, like just right. And we had ours like pretty good from the beginning, just because we had the support of all these apps. So I think there's a whole like ecosystem now, um, for startups and small, small companies. What was specific to creating Terraformation in particular? Like uh, what kinds of uh, subdivisions of the company did you have to create in like, a, you know, like a reforestation part and like a, you know, solar part and things like that? Oh yeah, that that's, that, we are kind of different from, I guess a lot of, we're, we're different from tech, tech startups and we're, mm -hmm. we're different from like forestry companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we have both a forestry division um, that is, you know, on the ground, actual operations, you know, you run nurseries, you plant trees. Um, and then we have a technology division that works closely with that division to build tools that accelerate that process. Hmm. Um, no one's really built a lot of software for um, forestry. Um, and, and or, or if they have, it's like it's sort of from like the late 90s, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like a distinct like generation back, right? It's yeah. kind of um, and we actually also have like a major comms department because one of the things that's important is we don't think we're going to do like, we're not, we're not going to achieve this like reforestation alone. We're not, we're not going to do it as one company. Um, what we're actually doing is we're trying to remove all the bottlenecks to scaling and enable all of the organizations that are right now already also doing reforestation to scale much more, much, much more faster and to get more investment and more, I guess, like support for the entire sector, right? And so we have a comms department that like, you know, talks about why reforestation is the best solution for climate change, right? Um, and we try to push that message and we try to build support for the entire sector because like that's actually the real thing that we're trying to do, right? We can't do it ourselves. Um, we are one of like hundreds of organizations that are doing this. And we're trying to increase the scale and rate of all of those organizations and the amount of funding going to all of them. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so we have like forestry tech, comms, um, and a bunch of other departments that like aren't as major for this discussion. Sure, sure. I imagine that some people watching this might be either in a startup or considering creating a startup and or some kind of company and I wonder if there's anything that like you wish you had known before you were a CEO of like about being a CEO that might be useful to someone like that. Oh, um, I think one of the things that other, other CEOs have talked about this. Um, this, one of the major things is it's an extreme emotional roller coaster. Um, so the ups and downs are, are really, really bad. Um, and, and so being able to manage your own psychology is really, really important, right? There will be things that are just like super, super exciting or good. And then like, you'll get some bad news and it's like existentially bad, right? Um, you know, life is like that. There's like ups and downs, but as a human, we sort of know how to deal with our ups and downs, right? Or, you know, most humans can, can deal with their ups and downs. Um, but then you're dealing with like ups and downs of like a company and it's like a new company the company is usually not profitable. So in, so the company is basically in like a state of total insecurity, right? You don't know if you're gonna live, right? And so like the ups and downs are, are really like emotionally strong. Um, and so you have to, you have to be good at managing your own psychology. And, and that's something that, I don't know, you sort of develop as you get older. <laughs> and, um, 
and or I mean, it helps to talk to other CEOs um, who've been through it, so they can tell you like, oh yeah, like this bad thing that you're facing is like actually really bad, um, versus like this really bad thing is just like, it's bad. You just sort of handle it and it'll be okay. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things. There, there's like all sorts of other things, but like managing people, managing organizations, this is like difficult. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, maybe we could switch gears to talking about solar punk art, and maybe you could just tell me broadly how you got interested in solar punk art and what made you inspired to start the contest. You know, prior to this, I never really thought of solar punk as like a distinct movement. It's more that like there are depictions of the future that are dark and dystopian. And then there are distinct pictures of the future that are not. Um, and up through the end of last century, most sci-fi depicted the future as being like pretty utopian, right? I think that was like exemplified by like Star Trek Next Generation, which was like the last of the Star Treks that was like very, you know, like, oh, in the future, we've outgrown all of our petty differences. And, you know, we like explore the galaxy in this enlightened way. Um, and at the time, the, the feeling was like, okay, well, that's like kind of naive and utopian, but, you know, we like it, right? It's cool. Um, and around the, you know, in the early aughts, I don't know, well, what, do you, what do you call that decade? Um, <laughs> the early 2000s, um, there were more like gritty depictions, right, of the future, right? Like even Star Trek moved to like Deep Space Nine, hmm. right? It was sort of this allegory for like post Holocaust, right? Like Kardashians are. Um, and, and, and so like at that time, and so there were more like gritty depictions of the future. And at that time that was like kind of celebrated. I was like, oh, this is really great. This is like a more realistic view of human nature, right? The future is gonna be, it's not gonna, the future is not gonna be perfect, right? It's gonna be gritty. Um, so there are a bunch of movies that sort of move in that direction or just like television shows or whatever. Um, and very sort of gradually through the, over the last like 20 years, almost all depictions of the future became pretty dark and dystopian. Um, and that's probably like a reflection of how people view the world, right? Um, and now it's gotten to the point where it's sort of relentlessly dark and dystopian, right? You, you, have, you, you now have an entire generation of young people who have grown up, like if you were born in the 90s, your entire life has been characterized by, or in America, in, your, your entire life has been characterized by, there's a war on terror, right? And, and there's a whole bunch of like propaganda, like there's a whole, you know, this cloud of that, right? Where it's like war on terror, um, it's very uncertain, right? Like the country has been in a war for 20 years. Um, and, you know, people think, okay, well, it's not like total war back home, but like if you're in a war for 20 years, you're spending trillions of dollars, right? That would otherwise, you know, go into your economy. Um, and so like all these young people have grown up in an atmosphere of like war on terror, um, economic crashes, right? We have had multiple crashes um, and then this climate crisis, right? Almost everyone alive today has actually never known a world where the climate problem wasn't a problem, right? Like if you think back, like I'm, you know, I'm a little bit earlier than, than that, but I still remember like I, my entire life, climate change has been a problem, right? There, like no one has grown up in a world where climate change was not at least spoken of as a problem, right? And, and so it's this very bleak future that we've painted for ourselves, right? There's like war, climate, economic instability. And then for like, <laughs> young kids today, it was like COVID is gonna be like a defining experience of their lives, right? And, and so the feeling about the future is actually just like relentlessly dark, like right now. Um, and I don't think it has to be. I think it's one of those things where it is what we decide to make it. Um, and in fact, there are a number of movements and technologies that are being developed now, which I think are very promising. They've just been like worked on by people who are, you know, small teams, whatever. And, and I think like when those things start to come together, um, there's, I, I think the future is actually much brighter than people think it is. Um, we're probably going to go through a 
uh, a period of economic and political upheaval in the next decade like that that's for sure just because like when you when you change over old systems it's like usually pretty messy um but i think sci-fi isn't what's, what's funny is like i think sci-fi actually lags sentiment I, I think hollywood is people think you know some people say like hollywood drives culture i think that's not true i think hollywood like lags culture um especially tech culture like people in hollywood don't know tech they're, they're always like years behind <laughs> um and so i think we just need to like lead all of that art in a new direction um and i didn't really know that's think of solar punk as like a specific genre until somebody asked me you know it's like you know like in our comms department right like our, our head of comms was like you know ishan what do you think our art aesthetic should be and i like thought a bit and i was like because our our our, our general message is one of hope and agency, right? Like our, our, our company communications are all around that. So we, we can do this, right? Um, and I was like, solar punk. And, <laughs> and you know, because like, it's, it's a future where technology is not viewed as like this thing that's destroying the planet, right? Th that, that's like a very popular idea now you know technology is like this bad thing um but no it's used to revitalize the planet and help us live in harmony and live like richer and more abundant lives um and increase life right like um i talked to uh diego from pachama a lot about this and you know the way he put it was like it's high trees and high technology right <laughs> so um you can restore the world using you can restore the natural world using tech you can increase abundance and the you know quality of life for people um and it could be a bright future right like we can we, we can make the world good um the way he put it was like you should imagine the best version of the future and you should go try to build that so so what what inspired you to start the contest after you learned about solar punk art and everything um i had a i'd had the idea for the contest for a while just because i was like okay we need more solar punk art like if mm -hmm. you look up solar punk art there's there's actually like maybe like a dozen pictures that just come up right They're yeah. all just, there's, there's not very there's not very much um and so i was like okay the world needs more solar punk art um and so i was like i should start a contest and just like you know give out a bunch of prizes for it and get people to make solar punk art um and I'm really busy with my day job, so I, <laughs> it's just like hard to do that. And and so, Justine Norton Kurtzen, who is the I think editor, I, I don't remember her um, exact um, position, but one one of the key people behind Solar Punk Magazine, like put out a call for um, entries, uh, short stories for Solar Punk. And I was like, this is great, um, and the contest web page for that had like a great description of like why solar punk right um and so i was like you know maybe i should like do this contest and it happened to be a weekend where i didn't have as much work um so i like wrote up the whole thing and said like okay i'm gonna start the solar punk art contest and i'm gonna put in like ten thousand dollars worth of prizes um and i like really wasn't sure like if <laughs> if it would work at all but it's like okay he's gonna try this um so it's more like okay kicking the seat of the pants someone else is doing a solar punk magazine i really ought to get off my ass and like be contributing <laughs> to this and so i like made the solar punk art contest right um and, and it turned out like really well um there's a lot of people who are it's, it's not like yearning for a better vision of the future but who like actually agree that we should look at the future in a more optimistic way and we should actually try to build that right it's, it's not just like waiting and thinking things are going to get better or thinking you think that things are going to get worse right that's like the sort of like passive mentality it's it's more like things can be better if we make it better right so there, there was there's actually a surprising number of people who think that way right and and feel like we should like we have agency and we should be building it um and so it actually like um was pretty warmly received. Maybe just this is like my Twitter bubble. I don't know. But there were a lot of people I didn't know. <laughs> I thought it was great too. Um, 
so yeah and, and so then we were off to the races did it surprise you like it seemed like there was a lot of support that came out of like more people giving money and other forms of support like did that like what kinds of support do people give and did that surprise you uh yeah that was actually really awesome so mm -hmm. um a bunch of people contributed prizes um, I think the total prize pool was nearly double what I had originally put in. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of people were just like, yeah, I just want to contribute prize money to this. Um, and yeah, that, that was actually just like really awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there, there are people from like on the other side of the planet that had like trouble sending me money through, <laughs> right? It was, like, it, it was like far enough away. So it wasn't just like the US, right? Um, so, so it was kind of like global support, um, and then also just like entries from around the world. Um, mm -hmm. So that that was that was really awesome. It was very really very, really heartening to to see so much support and the diversity of support mm -hmm. um, people from all sorts of areas and, and places, and you know, uh, I don't know what we call it, like industry verticals. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people care about this. Yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, how many people ended up submitting to the contest? I think all in we had 42 or 43 submissions. Okay, wow. Yeah, it was it was a good number. I was actually a little worried heading into the final weekend. We'd only gotten like 20 of them. Mm -hmm. And I committed to giving out 10 prizes. So uh -huh. It was like, well, I don't know if it's going to work out. Um, but then like in the final 24 hours, I got like 20 submissions. Yes. Where, like, 24 something just like a huge and I, I was like oh of course everyone's gonna wait till the last minute mm -hmm. <laughs> right so with with 43 or so um i have them all on a spreadsheet mm -hmm. um that that was like a really good number so, mm -hmm. yeah yeah really. uh, i'm pleased with uh you know how many people submitted and uh you know just uh for me it was like I've just been drawing for the last year and uh, or the last few months, and it was like, oh, I should submit to that because, uh, you know, I, I didn't really expect that I would necessarily do very well, but it seemed like a good challenge and like pushed me in my drawing, and also it was like contributing to something that I wanted to do, and uh, yeah, it was yeah, really exactly what I'm hoping. Yeah, that was exactly what I was hoping would happen. Like, yeah, you know, like drawing something that they wouldn't otherwise be pushed to do. I think definitely, was... definitely. Did I, I imagine, you know, you talked earlier about like, and I, I looked this up too, like when I started submitting something for the contest, I was like looking for examples and like there, there really isn't that much. And I wonder um, if the art that was submitted ended up surprising you in any way, or if there was something different about it than previous solar punk art that you'd seen before, if there was anything in the styles that people submitted that surprised you or delighted you or anything like that. Um. It was actually amazing mm. the diversity of both medium and subject matter mm -hmm. was really amazing. Uh, so, so some of it was like really crazy and like kind of barely solar punk. Some of it was mm -hmm. like just punk. Mm -hmm. um, but like um, some of these, you know, didn't win, right? But uh, there, there was like a stop motion thing another person made a sculpture out of potted flowers. Wow. Um, and then like there, there was actually some, when one was an actual acrylic painting, um, the, one of the winning ones was like a VR world. Mm -hmm. right? I, I actually like did not know that that, that could be done that way. Um, and uh, and one of the top three was the the song, or I didn't anticipate anyone creating music for this. Mm -hmm. The song was amazing. Um, and uh, so I, I think what surprised me was that it, it wasn't just like art, because, because I, I looked for like previous instances of solar punk art contests. Mm -hmm. and there had been like one such example, and it was an art contest on art station where it wasn't like they were doing solar punk. It was like, okay, the theme for this art contest is solar punk. They had like mm -hmm. other contests with their themes. And so there were, you know, the winners for that were all, you know, digital art. They were all like of a certain type. Mm -hmm. um, so I was expecting something along those lines, but it turned out actually to be a much wider, much more diverse 
um, set of mediums. Uh, and then there is also a, a lot of um, 3D rendered art. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was actually just like really delightful. Like looking through all the entries was like sort of like the highlight of that weekend mm -hmm. um, after they all came in. And it was just like, wow, like people are really inspired and really creative mm -hmm. um, and just like about all of these things. Um, so that was really surprising and just like really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did anyone send any like messages alongside their emails that surprised you or did you hear anything from the contestants that uh, along the way or uh, anything like that? Um, yeah, I actually for every single piece, I have, I have a little file that's like called like artist statement. Mm. Um, and then that's just really like all correspondence I received relating to that. And so some people told a story about mm. the thing that they had they made. So, so for some of the um, entries that's it's published alongside that story, mm -hmm. people alongside their piece. Um, other, you know, other people, it's just like their email, like, hey, did you get this? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, and uh, I think there were a number of people who had the, a similar experience to you, which was like, yeah, I've been drawing for a while or I've been making art. And this really pushed me to expand my boundaries and try something new. Um, I think at least two of the entries that were in the top 10 um, if you look at their portfolio, they don't draw anything like that, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing like that in there. Um, and they were all just trying something new, right? Um, and that, that makes me really happy, right? It's like, okay, like, it, it pushed some boundaries for some artists, right? To do something new. Um, and I think it's like really awesome. Yeah. I was uh, sort of procrastinating working on an entry and then I hit on a strategy for like how to make my art, which was like, I was gonna make a bunch of drawings and like, I started with the simplest possible drawing that I could do that was solar punk art in my own view, which was like one tree with like a sunset behind it. I was like, that's solar punk. And then like <laughs> each one I like built up a little bit more detail. And uh, yes, I think some of the ones that I, yeah, they were previous existing art, so I didn't submit them, but they were like, yeah, they, they turned out pretty well. And I, I learned a lot about like, uh, how to do skies and colors and like trees and things like that that was really enjoyable so yeah it's it's a real like composite of many things right it's it's not just nature it's mm -hmm. not just like, mechanical things it's a sort of um harmonious blend of all those things mm -hmm. um, so yeah absolutely yeah um i wonder did you you mentioned that you might be running another contest at some point. Did I read that correctly? Yes, I, I'm almost certainly going to run another contest. Mm -hmm. um, I, just, I just have to finish, I have to finish sending out all the, the prizes for this one, mm -hmm. um, which is actually a lot. I decided to, to give a token participation award to everybody who submitted. So yeah, I saw that. That's very generous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so um, that <laughs> sending money to 50 random strangers around the world is actually really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like slowly working my way through the list. Um, but I got to do that. Um, I want to figure out like if there's anything I want to change. Right. Um, and yeah, so I'm almost certainly going to run another one. Um, I'd like to do it over the holidays when people have time. Um, of course, everyone will still like turn the wall in at the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's somewhat nerve wracking for me. It's like, are we getting enough submissions? And then there, suddenly. Um, so yeah, def definitely another one. Um, hoping it gets like even wider distribution. Um, yeah, it would just be, it would be great to actually just keep running these contests. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, I like, you know, artists should get paid for their work. This is already, that's already like a very difficult like problem, right? The situation for artists, All right? And so I would like to get more money in the hands of artists making mm -hmm. solar punk art, right? And mm -hmm. popularize this art style. So I want to see more of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything that you learned from the first contest that you'll plan to incorporate into the second one? Um, hmm. Be prepared to do a bunch of organization after you receive all the entries. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to sort of like organize them mm -hmm. very well to be able to judge them properly. And I, I didn't, like it took me an entire like weekend to go through all the entries and just like get them into a state where I could like look at them all in some sort of unified way. So make sure you put aside enough time for that. Um, one thing that I learned is actually that 
I am now very convinced that crypto is definitely going to be the global um, kind of like money financial system of the future. So you think um, crypto is going to be the financial system is, of the uh, future? Yeah, I, I was like pro crypto before this, but it was mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, crypto is like a large number of the people who are not in the US, right? When I was like, okay, hey, I want to send you money, right? Like, how, what's the best way to like send you the prize money? They're like, mm -hmm. oh, just crypto, right? Like, here's my address. Uh -huh. Like, um, existing financial systems are very nation state boundary bound, right? Like, mm -hmm. cross border payments, it's a thing but it's not easy it's not casual you know you have a you know you have a high school student somewhere um <clears throat> doing art for an art contest and they get a prize right it's like they're not gonna whatever whatever cross-border wire or something swift code all that stuff right they're, they're, they don't know it's like you no know, just like send me crypto right it works um so it's like people in the u.s have the benefit of like a fairly mature banking system and then sort of like internet money sending services that have been built on top of that to sort of like kind of abstract away the, the messy, horrible legacy-ness of it. And so, so they don't really see that it's a big thing, but it's really true that like the rest of the world in order to connect to a global financial system is just gonna use crypto. Mm -hmm. Okay, crypto is taking over. This is like one thing I learned. <laughs> so yeah. All right, try to send money to a, to 40 random people around the world and you will see what I mean. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Uh, I know one of the requirements for submissions was like showing the work in progress as it happened. What was important to you about? Oh yeah, um, so er early on I actually got some advice about how to run these contests and it was just like, you wanna ask for work in progress um, just because you want to make sure that people aren't like copying art from somewhere. So you want like some proof that they were drawing it. Like that, mm -hmm. that's the sensible reason. Um, I was pretty sure that people weren't going to like fake up art or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, because there's no solar art anymore, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So, so that, that wasn't as much a concern. Um, it, that turned out to be um, only really relevant in a few cases. Like in some cases, there were, there were a couple entries where like, the work in progress was more interesting than the final product. Mm. Um, and so that was, yeah, the work in product thing didn't end up being like as, as huge a deal. Mm. Um, it was interesting to see the, the sequence of work, um, but it wasn't like a, as, as big a thing. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Um, and what was the judging process like? What did that involve? Um, you look at all of them and you mm -hmm. think about how you feel about them and what they say about some punk. Did, did I see that uh, you like had some other people involved in the judging process as well? Yeah, I actually pulled in a few other people. Um, basically like when I looked at it, I was like, wow, this is like crazy and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel like I should get like some other opinions. So while I, while I kept the right to do the final judging, I pulled in a few other people mm -hmm. just to give their opinions on it. Right, mm -hmm. and like the ones that they felt should win. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was fun. Mm -hmm. It's nice to hear how you ran it, and I, I'm like part of the sort of motivation for a lot of the questions. Is I am at, I know, like you talked about your company, like really valuing agency, and it's like you running this contest has a lot of agency. You running your company has a lot of agency, and like I imagine it might inspire others to like do maybe maybe the might run a contest or start a company, but just like hearing about how that was for you uh, might move something for someone else of what they would feel inspired to do on their own with their own also, agency. Yeah, I, I think that like, there's an increasing set of, or increasing amount of like despair, you know, like because of the last 20 years, right? Like things are awful. You know, you live in this world with like huge institutions that are um, crumbling or whatever they're, or, or calcified, and so you can't do anything to change the system, right? I don't think that's true, mm -hmm. right? You absolutely can. Um, I think young people today are extremely capable, um, much more empowered than they think they are, right? Like they, they have been taught a history of what people in the past were like or were able to do and, and don't have an actual, a realistic baseline to understand that they are 
actually very, very empowered. They are way more able to collaborate and talk to their allies around the world than any other um, generation. Um, they all have a supercomputer in their pocket. <laughs> right? like the, the, the power of that is not to be like discounted. That like amplifies your ability to hack just in an enormous way. Um, and, and, and so I, I think like, you know, showing examples of doing great things or even doing small things, right, is really, really important, right? Like people imitate what you do. So <laughs> yeah, get off your ass and do things. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, is there anything like nearby, anything that we've talked about that you'd like to say more about or uh, talk more about? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> let's see. You've, uh, you've covered a lot of topics. Mm -hmm. there's contest, uh, there's climate change. Um, I got to get in my thing about agency and rah, rah, young people <laughs> get on their ass. Um, yes, I, I would like to reiterate that message, right? Just like, get off your ass and do things. Mm -hmm. um, you, you don't have to do awesome or great or significant things. You, you sort of just like get rolling, right? Um, and other people see you do it they do too, you start working together. It's all sort of a gradual process, but it's important to get started. Um, and I think that that's more important than anything. Mm. Beautiful, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, thank you for uh, the work you're doing with your company and also with the contest. It was really inspiring to me to see you put it out there and it was a, a privilege to be a participant in it. And uh, I'm excited to hear that you'll be doing more with that in the future. And thank you for talking with me about it today. Cool, cool. Well, thank you for inviting me on your podcast. My pleasure.